Hello, everyone. I'm back. And again, for those of you who don't know me, this is Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein. I'm going to be teaching the class today. And we are learning from the Russian genius, Daniel Dubov, specifically his openings. He basically has been revolutionizing chess openings in the past few years. I want to say he's probably the most important theoretician to this day, where whenever he plays an idea or a game, everyone, and I mean, including Magnus Carlsen, will repeat that. Now, fun fact, you may already know that. Did you know who was Magnus Carlsen's second during his match against Caruana? And who was the main guy to make Magnus play the opening that he did against Caruana? For those of you who may not remember, what did Magnus play against E4 as his main opening? Kind of big shocker to the whole world. All right, people are saying Dubov. Yep, Dubov was one of his seconds. But which opening did Dubov persuade Magnus to play in the match? The Sveshnikov. That's right, Eric. Yes, Sveshnikov. So Dubov knows a lot of openings and has ideas in pretty much every opening. And it was because of Dubov and the Sveshnikov how Magnus defeated Caruana. One of the main openings, of course, was the Sveshnikov. Of course, there are many, many others including the C4 on move one and really cool English ideas. So Magnus is really good about picking his second. And funny enough, Dubov is probably one of the best theoreticians. Maybe Magnus already knew back then. You know, that was a, you know, a couple of years ago, but still we are learning from Dubov. Now in this game, we are jumping right into one of his games. Remember the way it works is I will be asking you questions uh, in kind of solitaire chess format where you get to guess the moves and try to answer questions. And hopefully we're all le learning here today. Uh, this game, Dubov was playing against Hikaru Nakamura during one of the online Magnus Carlsen chess tours from 2020. And let's take a look at this game. So we know that Hikaru loves the theory. He is one of the you know, modern theoreticians as well. He has a whole team and engines working for him. So let's see Dubov's ideas against Hikaru's ideas. This is a very important game. Okay, so in this game, Hikaru is white. So E4 is played. Okay, guys, so far so good. Now, Dubov, as we already saw, he plays many openings. He can play E5, he can play C5 in this game, he of course decides to play a little bit sharper stuff. So he's going to play C5, but no Sveshnikov actually. He has other plans. He plays D6. Now, who wants to guess which opening Black is going for with this move D6? Any guesses? You can just put it in the chat. Eric says the Nidorf. Good guess, Eric. Another Eric says the Dragon. Roger says Sozin. Okay, I guess Shabinigan. Wow, people have a lot of interesting ideas there. I think neither was a pretty good guess. Dragon was a very, uh, you know, ambitious guess, I want to say. Dragon is very hardly played, although you still see it, especially Hikaru has played it. Dragon Dorg. Oh, you mean Dragon Dorf? Yeah, Dragon Dorf. That's actually quite a cool opening, too. Nope, so far, no one has guessed the opening. Okay, let's make a couple more moves. You're all guessing, but you're not quite getting what he's going for. Pawn takes, takes, here, here. And that's right. Classical Rouser. This is the modern twist of theory. Old openings, such as the classical Sicilian, are getting revived. Believe it or not, this is just as popular at the top level as the Nidorf. Yeah, they are revived. That's right, because of modern engines. So here is the thing. Many of you may not even have played the classical 
And you may need a little bit of a brush up on trying to understand what is the idea. Richter Rouser, yeah. So first of all, the reason why people actually don't like this move 96 is because of this very aggressive plan involves with Bishop G5. Richter Rouser. Now, who knows what Richter Rouser is? I mean, is this is this a name? What is this, guys? Do you know your history, first of all? What is this whole Richter Rouser thing? Anyone can, can teach us? Maybe you guys know. If not, this is a good learning opportunity for everyone. <laughs> named after a guy named Rouser. Good guess. <laughs> Never heard of Richter. Richter scale. Okay, so people have heard, although unrelated, but good. <laughs> in earthquakes yeah so usually chess openings are named right after chess players yeah so there was a german master kurt richter and the russian master rouser and they basically sort of invented the setup for white now we you know we know about the setup or you guys may know about the setup from the nidorf right in the nidorf bishop goes to g5 but with a twist, here white may not need to play f4, okay? White, as Hikaru shows, has other ideas. So bishop d7 is the quiet, tricky move by Dubov. Now, I have to say, e6 is by far more popular, and it's going to transpose. This is the more classical way to play, but bishop d7 is... A little bit hidden it has some hidden ideas so queen d2 of course a6 very quiet move again you may not understand what is black doing he's not developing his king side at all hikaru just castles the most aggressive plan there is is white all right so probably a lot of you guys are familiar with this plan and now e6 very similar to the Nidorf, except in the Nidorf, the knight is usually on b8 and it can go to d7. Yet it is it is actually quite different from the Nidorf as well. So here white has too many two main plans. Who can tell me the two main plans for white? All right, guys, focus, focus on the chess. Okay, one plan is to play f4. Good. What is the second plan? So f4, I would say that's main line. And that's a very, very cool position after f4. And what's the other plan for white? Anybody else? So f4 looks like people are familiar with this f4 plan. Maybe some f4, f5 or f4, e5. Uh, g4, Eric says, yes, g4 is not a bad idea, but the problem is you got to, although maybe you can even play g4 this move, although I've never really seen it, but you got to prepare g4. You probably don't want to take one f6, though, too early, guys. In these positions, giving up the bishop pair is not recommended yet. Any other plans besides f4? Okay, let's give people some time. h3. Okay, h3 with idea g4 is not bad, but f3, yes. f3 is very, very popular move. A very popular move. So Hikaru actually played king b1. Very cunning move. He keeps his options open. Maybe I'll play f3. Maybe I'll play f4. So in the game, black plays bishop e7. And Hikaru plays f3. Now, for those of you who play the e4 opening or uh, the Nidorf, this kind of setup, f3, right, e4, g2 with the king on b1, sometimes g4. Bishop usually is on e3 is called the, um, maybe you guys can tell me, what is it called? It has a name, the setup for what? Against the, uh, usually against the Nidorf players. All right, good guess by Gary. Gary says the Yugoslav attack. Actually, Yugoslav attack is an excellent guess, except Yugoslav is against the dragon. But the setup is the same. That's dragon, yes. 
Lasker attack. I've never heard of Lasker attack specifically. I'm not sure if even Lasker played like that back in the day. Uh, this is mostly has been invent, invented by the uh, British players in the 80s. And you may probably guess the name is the English attack. Yes, it's called the English attack because it was invented by a lot of British players, grandmasters in the 80s and 90s. And it sort of became very popular in the 2000s and sort of became mainstream against the Nidorf. So the plan is the following. This bishop on g5 looks a little bit loose. Usually the bishop belongs on e3. But the plan is to start pushing the pawns, get that bishop back on e3, play g5, kick the knight, h5, g6, checkmate black, game over. As simple as that, guys. You simply want to push the pawns and checkmate black. Now, if black, of course, complies. Now, to comply, black would probably need to castle kingside, right, and then allow white pawn storm to happen. However, modern chess players are tricky. They're very sneaky chess players. Guess what? Dubov plays here. He plays knight takes knight. As a matter of fact, a lot of moves have been tried in this position. Queen c7 has been tried, okay? Castle has been tried, of course, natural move. Rook c8 has been tried. b5 has been tried. We're going to come back to b5 in a second. Yet Dubov's move, knight takes d4, is extremely rare. Now, you may not be aware of all these different options and why knight takes d4 is such a fresh idea. So in order for knight takes d4, for you to understand why knight takes d4 is a powerful idea, you really need to examine other options. I have seen knight takes d4 and only like one other line. Okay, so it's pretty rare move, right? So who can tell me what the point of knight takes d4? And now we're going to talk a little bit about how one should study openings. Now, let's say you buy a chessable course. I don't know how many of you love chessable. A lot of people probably. And the author says, in this position, play knight takes d4. Without much explanation, it just says because Dubov played it or because... The engine says it's the best move. Then queen takes d4, and the line continues, right? Well, as you probably know, you want to understand every move you play in a chess game. So I want to understand why do I trade the knights? Why not b5? If I want to checkmate the king, why not start the pawn store? I want to understand why not queen c7 or rook c8? Why not castle? Why not maybe h6 kick the bishop? I have a lot of questions. Usually, those questions are not answers because that's going to take a lot, of, a lot of moves from black. But when you learn openings, it's vital to ask these questions because only through these questions, knight takes d4 may make sense. You know, theory evolves, right? Knight takes d4 was not the main move for many years, if not decades. All of a sudden, Dubov comes along, plays that move. Everyone starts repeating. No clue why. Okay, knight takes d4. Looks like any other good-looking move. So here's my question to you. Why knight takes d4? What's the point? So again, this is the question. Rare idea. What is the point? Anybody in the chat? Weakens the bishop. I'm not sure how knight takes d4 weakens the bishop and which bishop are you talking about? Ah, to play e5. Okay, so there is one idea in the chat to play e5, although I don't think this is the right plan, but that's still an interesting question. Like, do you want to get the queen into the open uh, territory so you can hit the queen? Uh, weakens the g5 bishop. Uh, I'm not really sure how you can take advantage of that. You know, it's not like the knight has any cool jumps. Because knight takes e4 does not work. Make sure you look at your tactics carefully. Maybe queen a5. Okay, that's not the idea, but that's an interesting question. Maybe we can use a tempo to hit the bishop. Usually white's going to play h4 anyways. Maybe knight d5. Uh, I don't know about knight d5. You're really weakening the g7 pawn there. Plus, if bishop takes e7, d6 pawn is weak. So you see, a lot of you are trying to guess 
And some of your guesses actually make a lot of sense, but that's not the reason, guys. It's very, very sneaky. All right. As a matter of fact, the only way to understand why knight takes d4 is bad, I mean, is good rather, is to understand why b5 may not be so good. So let's go back and try to work our way backwards. Let's ask ourselves a question. What if we just play b5 and just checkmate our opponent first? We're going to play b4, a5, a4, b3, game over. OK, let's see what people are saying. Alexander, uh-huh, interesting idea. Very nice, Sanjana. So people are uh, not knight takes b5. Don't be, don't be concerned about the sack. It doesn't work, guys. But it, it is tempting, right? Tempting to sack, but it doesn't work. I think people are kind of slowly getting the point, getting the point of what White is trying to achieve here. So again, what can White play after b5? How can White take advantage of this early b5 push? And not a lot of no people know about that, I have to say. Uh, no, you never want to play a4. You never want to play a4. That is a ticket to disaster. Your king is going to be exposed, right? You're going to open up a file, and that's bad news usually. All right, so most people, I think, are getting slowly the idea, but not quite how to execute it properly. The answer is white has a now cool idea. The knight can take on c6, and after bishop takes c6, the next rerouting is vital to know. So if you're a white player, if you play this as white, you have to know the next plan. Can anybody tell me the plan, the rerouting? Yes, this rerouting knight e2, d4 is absolutely essential. This knight is a monster, and notice it's not going to get hit by the pawn. And what's you can actually start with the move h4 first. You can start with knight e2 or wait for b4. It doesn't really matter. Here comes the knight. Here comes the knight. Bishop is under attack. Plus over minus I gave. Already bishop's under attack. White is gaining this very powerful b5 square. Black's attack is nowhere to be seen. Lots of pressure. And... Again, this king is not quite safe yet. It's on e8, that's okay. But again, the problem is the position is too loose for black. So once you know that white's real plan in this opening is to trade on c6, reroute the knight to e2, d4. Now, without <laughs> much thought, you guys are the ones who can explain to me why Dubov took on d4. Who can tell me why he took on d4? Now everything makes sense. Everything is clear cut. Exactly. D4 square is blocked. That's right, guys. And this knight that wants to go to E2 and D4, well, guess what? White's going to have to waste an entire tempo. Entire tempo, which is basically vital with opposite castling, right? Remember, gaining one tempo is going to be huge. So this is how slowly, right, by kind of looking at all the options, knowing B5, knowing White's ideas, we come to understanding why Dubov's move is absolutely the best. That's right. That's another tempo, as Ryan point, points out, because when the knight gets to D4, that bishop on C6 is simply misplaced. It has to go back to D7. So that's another tempo loss, right? So that's actually quite serious tempo loss for black if you allow knight takes c6 knight e2 all right so this is all theory i guess modern theory nakamura says all right i'm gonna play after queen c7 i'm gonna play h4 anyways <clears throat> so what is black's plan guys okay let's give you some time to think it over We kind of already know what, the, what is Black's plan. Get space and try to checkmate the white king on the queen side. Yeah, pretty much Joshua nailed it. Yeah, we're just going to try to push our pawns. <clears throat> so the plan is b5. 
Notice one thing, Dubov is not in a hurry to walk his king into the attack. Okay, this is kind of important to notice. Okay, Hikaru simply realizes queen is misplaced. Queen d2, b4. The next few moves are quite logical. Knight's coming to e2, a5, and of course, knight d4 could be played. In this specific game, so Hikaru actually tried knight d4, didn't get anywhere with knight d4. In this specific game, he prepared a really cool idea, this move c4. Very unusual idea. And the point being is that normally you never want to push the pawns in front of your own king. This is an exception. Because the point now is if pawn takes on passant, the knight comes in. And because of this vital b5 square, later Hikaru actually even tries to play for a4. Now, this all happened. White lost the game. Okay. This was Hikaru against Sam Shankland. And Sam is one of the best players in this opening. He himself loves the classical Sicilian. So this is interesting that Sam outplayed Hikaru from this position. Yeah, this is a very complex position. Normally, you don't do this kind of thing in front of your own king. But this is somewhat playable because you are getting this outpost, which in return will block the half open file. So we're not going to be de debating the nuances of this opening today. I just want to introduce to you Dubov's approach to the openings and how he is changing chess theory. So let's show you, for example, some other moves. Let's look at knight d4. That's the most logical move. Okay, I want to just kind of walk you through what could happen here. Rook b8 could happen. Right? I actually found an improvement. I think rook b8 was played by, by Dubov himself. I think castle is a pretty cool move because we gained that tempi, right? Remember that white's queen retreated and then we didn't have to move our bishop back to d7. And now h5. It looks as though white is attacking first, right? h6 may be coming. In reality, there are no threats. We just play h6 ourselves. He can sacrifice the piece. Although I don't think it's sound, I don't see any checkmate, right? The knight can guard on h7. You know, there is really no major pieces coming in to help out. I think black should win this. And I also analyzed this move bishop h4, trying to keep the pin going. But look how black's attack simply unfolds. a4, taking the b4 pawn looks pretty suicidal, walking into all sorts of tactics on the b file. Let's say g4. Rook c8, g5, pawn takes, bishop takes. And now, guys, I think black's position is very promising after this move b3. I feel like black is sort of first. And if white tries to lock things up with pawn takes, pawn takes a3, this is one of the methods to kind of fight the attacks with the pawns like this. Then a vital c2 square comes into play. So knight e4 may work. This is an interesting try. I kind of like e5 more. Simple chess. Queen c2 is coming. Yeah, he is in big trouble here. I think black is just crushing. So taking on b3 doesn't look good either. Yeah, so this is, this is absolutely crushing. Uh, this, this did not happen. This is just my analysis. An improvement over Dubov's other game, probably also against Hikaru. Uh, where knight d4 happened in a different game and Dubov played rook b8, okay? So going back to my original, uh, this game with c4, of course, pawn takes is, is not a bad move. Remember, Sam Shankland won against Hikaru in the later game. In this game, though, Dubov plays h6, which to me is a very clever move. Why is that a clever move, guys? After bishop takes, bishop takes, White simply wins the pawn. This is all Dubov's plan. Now my question for everyone is, you have a choice. Choose between queen a7, keeping the queens on the board, or trading the queens with queen takes queen. So how many would trade queens? Let me know in the chat. And how many would keep the queens with queen a7? I'm just curious to see what people, how people think here.
All right, so some people are saying keep the queen. Some people say queen d6, okay. Ryan says queen takes d6 probably. Roger says keep the queens. Aryan says trade. We are pretty much split in half and half so far. <laughs> it's like Kelsey, queen a7, own trade. I'm just reading the chat. It's funny. We don't have a consensus, consensus guys. I'd probably trade, Sanjan, okay. So yeah, it's 50-50 right down the middle so far. So people are being indecisive to trade or leave the queens. Well, guess what, guys? Dubov plays mistake. Queen a7, I gave his move question mark. Because he and many others probably think, why would I trade queens when I'm down material? Right? That's the first thing you think about. We are taught never to trade when you're down material, you know, unless we have to. But the answer is actually you want to trade the queens. This is counterintuitive uh, decision, but a lot of you, half of you got this right, as a matter of fact. So I want to show you first what happened in the game. e5 happened in the game. And after bishop d7, queen d4. Now, this type of trade queen, trading queens is different. The dark squares are not as controlled as the f6, b, um, you know, as the h8, a1 diagonal. And now again, he avoids the queen trade. Queen f4 is played. Castles, knight d4, a4, queen e4. The game is really complex. f5, yeah. And now pawn takes, bishop takes. This results in a very, very complex game where black's king, I believe, is also in danger. All right, so I don't want to go too much detail the rest of the game. It's not that important. What is important to me and for this kind of unusual decision is that a lot of the times Dubov, as the creator, gets a lot of ideas right. But then later, you notice sometimes he gets moves wrong. It's, that's okay. I mean, the, the position is pretty complex. And he should, of course, trade and play king e7. The key is to keep the bishop alive. No e5 option. And now, very instructive moment right here, guys. g5 securing those dark squares. It is actually total compensation for the pawn. Two bishops and dark squares. Yeah, prophylaxis. Yeah, Joshua is correct. This is prophylaxis. We want to really stop white from getting the pawn to f4, e5. So I've analyzed this out a little bit. And just to share with you, this is already equals over plus. I believe black is slightly better. We have a beautiful bishop. We have a beautiful rook. This guy, I'm not really sure where he's going. And in general, I don't really see how white can easily untangle. All right, so this is the first example of Dubov's unbelievable opening genius is how he understood this nuance that a lot of people sort of play these autopilot moves, castles, rook c8, queen c7, b5. But the real crux of the matter is this knight coming to d4, we don't want to give him an opportunity to trade. So knight takes d4 is an excellent choice. And the theory is only developing here. I expect more and more games in this line. Okay, as a matter of fact, if I were to make a quick search into my online database, you're going to see that what? A lot of people are playing Dubov's ideas, right? Pretty much knight takes d4 is getting more and more popular. And I have a feeling it's going to replace all the other moves quite soon. As a matter of fact, it's only 31 games. Very fresh move, indeed. Well, that's the power of modern chess. You have somebody like Dubov come along and revolutionize chess openings. <laughs> All right, so if no more questions here, we're going to move on to a different example, different opening. OK, let's move on. All right, so Geary against Dubov. Now, don't be fooled by the name of this tournament, Mr. Dodgy Invitational Blitz Game. I mean, most people don't even look at Blitz Game, let alone some weird name, Mr. Dodgy. Yet, this is a very important game for opening theory. And once again, Dubov is black. He's facing probably after Dubov, 
the most world-renowned theoretician, Anish Giri. Anish Giri is extremely, extremely good in theory and openings. So this is a really good test. Dubov is playing a subpar opening, so to say, not the most popular opening at the elite level, the King's Indian, G6. He really trusts in his King's, King's Indian. What about Caruana? Isn't he great with openings? I have to tell you guys, Caruana is a great chess player, but a lot of the opening ideas that he is playing are not necessarily his, and they're more Kazimjanov, his former uh, second slash coach. Kazimjanov actually uh, recently announced he's no longer working with Caruana, but I would not call Caruana the theoretician. He's more of a practical player. He doesn't come up with these crazy ideas himself. Yes, he prepares a lot and he has a team, probably Kazimjanov and a couple other guys, but you're right. He is not the ideas guy, whereas Dubov is generating these ideas himself. All right, so King's Indian, very risky, especially against Anish Giri. Giri decides to take the symmetrical line. I mean, not the symmetrical, the uh, Fanchero line, rather, which is supposed to be extra safe. Castles, castles, d6, castles, knight c6, knight c3. And here's my question to you, especially for those who follow King's Indian theory. What is the most popular move here for black? Or what does the theory recommend most popular move? Uh, okay, so a lot of you are quite familiar. So it's between e5 and a6, right? a6 is the move I play. So, okay, we have a couple of King's Indian players in the studio, in the audience rather. I myself also a King's Indian player. I usually play the move c6. I go for the other plan. I don't usually play knight c6 yet. This game, Dubov has a cool idea in mind. He plays an old move, a move that nobody really plays these days. He plays e5. Now, the combination of knight c6 and e5 is not popular, or it used to be not popular, because, of course, after d5, you have to retreat. But d5 has its own drawbacks. Not the old move, knight e7, the modern move, Knight b8. I call this complex play. The point is this bishop is now locked down. a5 is happening. Knight's coming in. Of course, f5 is still the idea. Very complex position. So modern theory, you know, back, you know, a couple of years ago, everyone plays a6. Of course, the point is to play rook b8 and b5. If d5, knight can swing to a5. Hikaru used to play King's Indian. He would play that way. A lot of players still do. But this move, knight c6 followed by e5, is extremely rare, but it is gaining lots and lots of traction and almost as main line as it gets these days. And so Giri follows the theoretical recommendation these days not to go for complexity, but try to get a plus position with pawn takes e5. Okay, pawn takes, bishop g5. And my question is, what would you play here as black? Very annoying pin. Knight d5 is the idea, or queen takes and knight d5. Anybody? So black to move. Some of you may actually know some theory for white or black. Does this look like uh, advantage for white? Well, that's what the theory says. Theory, it does look a little symmetrical. I agree. But theory gives white an advantage here. All right, so let's give people some thoughts. So bishop e6, queen e8. Uh, I'm not sure about queen e8. So far, no one's guessing. Uh, no one's guessing his move. Ah, somebody guessed the move, but then said it's bad. <laughs> I like it. Uh, e4 for black. I don't know about e4. You got to be careful about that. Bishop g4. No one's guessing his move yet. This is not easy. Aha. Uh -huh. Some people are finally realizing the idea here. 
nope, it's not the queen e8. Yeah, a lot of people are really trying to make bishop e6 work. All right, so you want to hear the answer? The move is h6. A couple of people mentioned h6, but then they said, oh, it doesn't work. So what is wrong with h6? What do you think, guys? There's a tactical problem with h6. It looks like it's just bad. Who can tell me why? Exactly right. Yep, Gary is correct. Yep, and a bunch of other people are also getting it right. Queen takes d8, rook takes d8, and of course, bam, bam, bam. We have a fork. Of course, you don't lose the bishop, right? So you play king g7 and knight takes c7. Believe it or not, this all happened in the game. Now, if this was not Dubov, if this was somebody unknown or lower rated, we can safely say, oh, yeah, he blundered the pawn because the rook is under attack. Guess what, guys? This is Dubov. Do you really think Dubov blitz this out to blunder a pawn? <laughs> Tricky question. Of course, he wouldn't do that. He wouldn't just blunder a pawn. I mean, maybe he could, but knowing how famous he is with his opening prep, there is something hidden here that Dubov knows. I don't know, guys, about Sack and the Rook. You're playing way too much bullet here. <laughs> the Blitz tournament, maybe. I don't know. I think the fact that this is a Blitz game is confusing a lot of people. I think this is some real deep opening innovation. And he actually decided to use this as a test in a Blitz game. I could seriously see people playing this in the regular game, too. Rook b8 is the move. It is rook b8. <laughs> Moral of the story, never accept the pawn in the opening from Dubov. Yeah, you guys remember my uh, last uh, lecture about Dubov and his pawn sacks. Yeah, something about Dubov and pawn sacrifices, right? He really loves those pawn sacks. All right, so Geary is still in his prep. He simply plays e4 to basically stop e4 and then get himself an outpost. Bishop e7 is played. Knight d5, as anticipated. And bishop c5. All right, guys. My question is, was this all planned or was this a blunder? I mean, after all, white's a basically healthy pawn up. What do you think? All calculated. Bishop g4, maybe bishop g4, yeah. It's an idea. Yeah, so this is the prep, guys. It's all prep. It's all prep. It's actually mentioned in a couple of chessable courses that white is better here. When I turn on my engine, my stockfish, it will give about 0.4 advantage. That's a pretty big advantage, 0.4, maybe 0.5. After all, it's a pawn. So what is it about Dubov and modern theory that he doesn't like, maybe he doesn't use stockfish, maybe he doesn't believe in modern theory, or maybe he understands chess on a different level? What is it about this position? Geary basically repeated what the theory says. Anybody? Can anybody crack the Dubov code here for me? All right, he uses Leela maybe. So yeah, Leela is definitely uh, an engine that a lot of top players use these days. Leela is like neural network, uh, original neural network. Stockfish has neural network built in, but still it's not the same as Leela. Well, most engines really give plus one, therefore there's compensation. Yeah, but half a pawn or 0.4 is still not great if you're going for this position directly from the opening. Yet something about Dubov and his understanding of the position. Yes, guys, that's right. 
I see one answer which I really like, Sanjana. It's much more difficult for a human to play this position as white. This is the key answer, human element. A lot of people, when you analyze openings, you forget. Yes, engines do show lines, but after all, humans will play the game. How likely is the human to play super accurately this position? By the way, I want to point out that Alpha Zero and Lila Chess are very much the same. Of course, it's different. Uh, Google wrote Alpha Zero and, and Lila is different, but the concept is more or less the same. So, you know, I would argue that it's it's quite Alpha Zero would also point point out this. Anyway, so the point here is let's look at the human element. We have an extra point. Is that point going anywhere? That point is not going anywhere. It's going to get blocked. Right? These pawns are going to get blocked. This side of the board is the same, except this bishop is stuck. We have a beautiful dark square bishop. We have an outpost. White has an outpost, but he can't really use anything, use that knight to put any more pressure on black. As a matter of fact, Dubov came to the conclusion that white's pawn is absolutely irrelevant. It doesn't really change the nature of the position. Black is rock solid, and he'd rather take black here. All right, so let's see what happened. A couple more moves. Rook FD1, logical move. Bishop E6. Bishop G4 is interesting too, but nothing wrong with Bishop E6. B3 and A5. Now, the more I analyze this position, when I analyze this with Stockfish, guess what it happens to its advantage? Plus 0.5 or 0.4 eventually goes to 0.2 and plummets to close to zero. So what Dubov did he goes deeper than everybody else. He uses additional engines. He looks at this position from a human element and he understands. As we start making moves, if white doesn't show a concrete plan, his extra pawn is meaningless. Position is equal. And that's the answer, guys. Black is completely safe. That extra pawn is meaningless. So let's see what happens. So Geary plays all the logical moves. Why not rook d2, right? Maybe a double on the open file. A4, though, Geary's looking for counterplay. Pawn takes A4. I don't like this move, guys. I don't like breaking up pawns like this. That's going to backfire badly. I gave this move question mark. Of course, it's a blitz game. Anything can happen. But look now what happens next. Rook A8. Knight C7 looks like, oh, fork. But Dubov saying, you know what? Please go ahead. Take my bishop on E6. Please double my pawns, because guess what? These pawns protect vital squares. It's actually not a big deal at all for the pawns to be doubled. Yep, white no longer has the d5 outpost, as Joshua correctly points out. So I actually prefer black, even though black is a pawn down. And I gave black an advantage. Uh, Geary was under pressure the entire game. He managed to draw by, by, some, by some luck. I'm just going to show you some moves here. Okay, eventually this a3 pawn could be taken, but he's not in a hurry. Eventually he takes it. And yeah, I stopped here. I said, okay, black is clearly better, but because the, it's opposite color bishops, it's not easy to win. But without doubt, Geary was under pressure most of the game, especially once he took an a4. So there you go, guys. There is the genius of Dubov once again at full display. Simply gave up a pawn. As the theory says, white's better. Completely wrong eval. He's so much deeper. And he changed single-handedly the nature of that position. All right, no questions. We're going to move on to my next example. <laughs> Withdraw when you see... <laughs> When you pair against Dubov. Yeah, that's funny. All right. Next one is a game from 2019. It's an older game. But the idea that he demonstrated several times in 2019 basically became an opening that none other than Irvin Lamy, Anish Giri II, had to make a chessable course. A chessable course. I believe that course may even be free. But the point is Dubov comes up with his own play in the Tarash. This is the opening that begins 
different move orders could happen. Let's say it begins like this. D5 takes, this is called the Tarsh defense. Not as popular anymore. I mean, Kasparov played it a couple of times as black back in the 80s. More or less by force, we get this position. And Giri, I mean, not Giri, Dubov comes up with a fresh way of playing this move. He simply takes the pawn. Most people have put the bishop on e7 and castled. Some people have tried c4. Nope, Dubov's not interested. He's got his own path. He takes takes bishop c5. All right, he is given white what we call IQP, clear target, right? It looks quite bad for black just to give white this target. I mean, the bishop is well placed, but white cannot quite keep the knight on d4 that well. So he plays knight takes knight. Before we look at knight takes knight, uh, yes, black gets IQP, but what I mean is that's a target for white, right? Uh, so knight takes knight is what happened in the game. But let's quickly take a look at how can white try to take advantage of this IQP. So knight b3 is the typical move. Bishop b6, castles, d4. All of this happened. All of this kind of theory, you can say. Knight a4, castles. And now both bishop g5 has been tried and knight takes b6 have been tried. So let's look at bishop g5 briefly. Uh, no, you couldn't take the d5 pawn earlier, Austin. Rook e8, this is all theory, rook e1. This is one of uh, Dubov's own games, I think against Magnus, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, takes, takes, bishop takes. No, this is all theory, by the way. I'm not making this up. Black just gives up a pawn like this. This all happened. I believe this was against Magnus. So lots of games now. You Sipinko played it, Magnus Dubov. Wow, this game, you see how many games now? This is all original Dubov analysis, and now everybody plays like this. This looks so bad. Black is just the pawn down, guys. It's an end game too. Yet, there's a reason why Dubov has a following. So many top players are repeating this end game. They're playing this exact way. Now, you're going to be shocked by his next move. Queen d8. What? You just gave up a pawn and then you go backwards with the queen? That makes no sense whatsoever. Well, that just tells you how creative Dubov is. He understood this position on a much deeper level than what you and I are looking at. Yes, the point is this knight is misplaced. We have two monster rooks. The king is weakened, and this bishop will have a final say. So what he's basically saying is that I am a pawn down, but I have compensation. And it's easier. Remember the human element that I keep repeating? It's easier to play as black, right? Because white has to defend. It's not fun to defend in chess. And black has the initiative. So in the game, queen c3 happened. Uh, not in this specific game. I'm talking about the uh, Magnus game. We're just looking at the sideline. Queen e7. This is, again, all of Dubov's prep. He played it in the Blitz game against Magnus in 2019 at the World uh, Blitz Ch and Rapid Championship. Knight c1. Okay, kind of ugly move, but the knight is misplaced here anyways. It protects the bad pawn. And now Dubov made an inaccuracy. He played actually h5 which is a very thematic idea, but not in this specific position. And after a3, rook a4, Magnus, I think, would have played f3. But the improvement here is a lot of people have repeated this way, is rook a4 first, and after f a3, then rook e4. This is exactly what Dubov wants, extra pressure here. White never wants to play e3 and weaken his king. Uh, well, you can call that theory, although... You know, there's only two or three games in the entire database. And now I think the theory sort of ends. Let me go back. Yeah, so there's only a couple of games here, as you see. But this is my analysis too. After b5, I came to the conclusion position is unclear. Black has good chances, good counterplay. It's just a complex position. Wow. But the fact that Dubov worked all of this out and blitzed this out against 
none other than the world champion. What confidence does that show you guys? He's not afraid to test his ideas against the best. Really amazing uh, strategy and self-confidence. Anyway, going back here, in this specific game, white did not want to test black in this line. So white did not play knight b3. He simply took on c6. And now we've got a potential target, right, on the C file. So it's not quite IQP anymore, but still it's weak structure. Of course, you can start with queen c2. You can start castles, castles. In the game, he started with queen c2. Both sides castled. Bishop b6. Uh, he has made a lot of ideas before, so he would be confident. Yeah, that's a good point. When you are so creative and your ideas work and you win a lot of games, you do get uh, confident with your ideas. So knight a4 happened. And again, if you look at this position, everything looks great for white. You have no weak pawns. I mean, pawns are perfect, right? Black has a clear target. White has this target here and a target there. I mean, what else? Do you, can you dream in modern chess? This is all you want, just a nice plus equal advantage. Yet, Dubov proves everybody wrong. This position looks like a good advantage for white, but in reality, it's far from simple, guys. And I want to share with you why. Bishop d7, first he protects the pawn. b3, why not get the bishop on a nice diagonal? Again, zero risk from white at first. It seems like white is dominating. His opponent rated 2685 is probably sitting there thinking, who is this Dubov guy? <laughs> He's so weak. He doesn't understand basic positional chess. I'm just going to plop my bishop there, move my one of my rooks. I don't know which rook here. Put the bishop there, put the knight there, and just slowly torture black using the d4, c5 outpost. Well, it is Dubov after all, and we've seen his creativity. Let's see what he comes up with here. Rook e8 gets the rook on the half open file. Bishop b2. And my question to everyone is, what would you play here as black? Wow, I already see immediate answer from Eric. Queen e7, instant, bullet. <laughs> Knight e4, c5, OK, interesting. Let's give people some more time. Remember, guys, guys this is Dubov. You got to be a little bit more creative than, than some random moves that at, at first look quite interesting, maybe too. But I want to show, I want to, I want to see some creativity from everyone. Okay, queen c8, I don't like. You want to trade the bishops, but you also come to the party with the weak pawn, right? So don't automatically assume that c6 pawn is going to solve your, solve its own problems. You need the bishop to protect the weak pawn. I would over him to resign. And then I play c5, says Joshua. Okay, very interesting. Knight g4, knight e5. Okay, c5, x clam. Wow, okay. Bishop g4. Okay, very interesting. Very interesting. Anybody else? Queen c8 again. We talked about queen c8. I don't like queen c8. All right, guys. You think you understand chess? Look at this next move, h5. I am shocked no one has proposed this move h5. Or maybe one person did, but I missed it. What on earth is this h5? Didn't we talk about alpha zero? Aren't you learning something from the neural networks by now? What is this h5 move? <laughs> I would resign if I were. Is this a shocker or is this common sense type of move? By now, I think most people understand where it's common from. The point is you want to play h4. There is no knight. If pawn takes, that weakens the king. If you don't, h3, we know the alpha zero, the h pawn, the hairy h pawn. Usually, uh, white plays h4 in a lot of openings. And this is Dubov's idea. Brilliant move h5. 
Oh, and my question is, guess black statistics in this position. So I think there were like four or five games in the database, if I'm not mistaken. 100%, says Gary. 100% black. 40% for white. <laughs> All right, let me show you guys. Show you the statistics here. Pretty bad for white, doesn't it look like so? White's not doing so good. And you got some pretty strong players there. Avronian, Jeffrey, Rodstein, Pankratov, Mikhail, like everyone over 2,500, 2,700. Isn't that pretty scary <laughs> for white to have that statistic going into this move H5? Yeah, that is pretty bad. White's not doing so good here. So that, again, is Dubov, right? The genius of Dubov. He probably had all of this prepared, including the move h5. And that is remarkable. Now, one thing that I do want to point out, that the game unfolded actually not that great for him. He messed up later. By the way, if h4, the knight e4, this is Aronin against Magnus. Um, e3 was played in this game. Of course, h4. Knight e4 is also playable, but it's a popular move. Why do I like h4? Knight takes bishop, queen c3. And here I said, evaluate the position. What would you play for black? This looks a little bit scary, doesn't it, this battery? Was everything from here all theory? Well, I guess if you consider Dubov's games a theory, then yes. But of course, back then, he's the only one making theory. Now everyone's going to be repeating his games, and more and more games will happen. Uh, but back then, it was only him. And now Magnus, of course, we know Magnus follows Dubov closely, right? Dubov being his uh, former second. What did you play here for Black? And I do want to point out that Dubov made a pretty serious mistake here. It looks equal. Okay. See what people are saying. And it's funny how Dubov does not follow through with his own plan. I would have thought for certain he would push the pawn. Isn't that the logical follow through with the H pawn? I don't know why he didn't do that. He took, I uh, know he played rook c8 and then he took one more chance to redeem himself. I don't like this plan because in the game, white took with the f-pawn, which looks a little suspicious. I actually think that this rook d4 and then transferring the rook over is quite annoying. I don't know, f4, there's lots of pressure. So yeah, I don't like this. Instead, I want to propose to you a better solution. He still managed to win in the game after white messed up, but he was a little bit of danger here. Yeah, white took with the f-pawn. H3 is my proposed solution, actually a little bit further back. I just want to show you my analysis, what could happen. Bishop H1, Rook C8, Rook D1. Let's say white plays the same way as in the game. Bishop F5, Rook E1, Queen E7. So you see, my idea is maybe to put the bishop on E4. If I trade those bishops, the queen will come in and checkmate the king. So F3 is quite logical. Right, I looked at the move f3. Again, I'm using kind of human judgment. Bishop g6. And then I looked at the move b4. Okay, let's expand. Maybe we'll play a4. And guess what? I'm playing human moves. And white is not doing so hot. Look at this. c5, brilliant idea. Pawn takes, pawn takes, rook takes d5. It looks as though I just blundered the pawn, right? Because of the battery. But all of this, surprisingly, and I checked this with with engines, it's actually bad for white. Black trades a pair of rooks, swings the queen to a7. Keep it an eye here, keep it an eye there. Basically, I came to the conclusion that white is playing down a piece. And black is better. So rook d1. It is hard to find queen a7, but the concept is, even if you don't play queen a7, black is better. c4, a3. Rook b8, queen d4. Again, this is kind of my analysis. It's not forced. And here I highlighted this bishop is out of the game. 
the queen wants to come in and the whole position, the bishop may come in there. The whole position is on the verge of collapse. And this is all thanks to Harry the H pawn. So Dubov had all the right ideas, but this is one of his first games in 2019 with this line, right? Which he kind of messed up. He should have played H3. I'm sure he went back home and realized he should have played H3. But the fact that everybody, and I mean everybody is playing his system now in the Tarsh. Let's go back and quickly look at the statistics. It tells you it is approved by the top players. So I'm just going to roll back here and point, point it out to you that C takes D is now de facto main, main line, and everybody plays this way, right? And you can just look at the names. Everybody, Magnus, Geary, Ding. I guess just, just look at the names. Yeah, this is the de facto modern theory. By the way, Knight takes you six statistic. is not looking so hot for white, right? Knight takes you six. That's what happened in the game. So in conclusion, I want to tell you that, you know, modern chess is more than just using an engine and databases. You can be like Geary or like Dubov, right? especially Dubov, extremely creative player, come up with ideas, human test those ideas, right? Try to understand from a human perspective and he backs it up with his analysis and engines. And no wonder that everybody is now following his ideas. All right, guys. So I hope you get to use some of these ideas in your own games and definitely try to look at the perspective from you know, the human eyes as opposed to the engine eyes. All right, thank you.